very good morning to all of you and welcome to the academic cow program uh, today's uh, lecture is on uh, rheumatology and we have invited dr amal sitira uh, tilakaratna who is the uh, consultant in rheumatology and medical rehabilitation attached to district general hospital mathale uh, dr tilakaratna obtained mbbs in second class honors from the faculty of medicine uh, university of colombo in 2008 an md in medicine from the pjim university of colombo in 2015 he completed membership of royal college of physicians uh, uk and the specialty certificate in rheumatology uk in 2018 uh, he was awarded with fellowship of royal college of physicians edinburgh in 2021 and london in 2023 he is a board certified consultant in rheumatology and medical rehabilitation since 2018 dr tilakaratna underwent traumatology training at uh, rheumatology and rehabilitation hospital ragama and russell's hall uh, hospital uh, in nhs uk uh, he served as a working group committee member of asia pacific league of association of rheumatology that's called apla the guideline committee on telemedicine in rheumatology was past member of apla special group uh, special interest group on vasculitis and uh, serves as a member of uh, apla special interest group uh, in uh, inflammatory myositis as well uh, dr tilak ratna is the current co-editor of the college of uh, specialist in rheumatology and rehabilitation sri lanka and he serves as uh, served at uh, dgs nuarelia and th kurunagala as consultant in rheumatology before uh, he assumed duties at uh, dgh mathale in 2021 august so let me warmly welcome dr amal sitaratilakratna uh, to the academic cow program if you have any questions related to the topic please send them over through the chat box and let's listen to dr amal yes thank you very much dr charuni uh, for those kind words of introduction uh, good morning all so today uh, what i would be talking about is on autoimmune inflammatory polyarthritis basically i would be giving an overview for primary care physicians so why should a primary care physician know about inflammatory arthritis so there are a few reasons why they should know about it one thing is to diagnose treat and refer the patients appropriately to specialized care the second thing is they need to identify extra articular manifestations as well as comorbidities associated with inflammatory arthritis and then to identify treatment related complications with these broad principles in mind this would be the outline of my presentation so i'll be talking about what an inflammatory arthritis is then would we'll talk on evaluating a pa patient with inflammatory arthritis later on move on to describe clinical phases of rheumatoid arthritis and would give some insight into rheumatoid arthritis management principles would be i wouldn't uh, talk about guidelines in de detail i would try to simplify it as ca which can be understand by a primary care physician and would briefly discuss few management pitfalls so to begin with what is an inflammatory arthritis so inflammatory polyarthritis before knowing uh, what polyarthritis and so on i would describe what a inflammatory joint symptom is it's a pain and swelling of joints non traumatic or not bony associated with early morning stiffness or inactivity stiffness lasting for more than 30 minutes and the symptoms should relieve with activities so uh, what i mean by inflammatory swelling is there are two kinds of swelling that you would come across in patients with arthritis one is the bony swelling and the other one would be boggy swelling which you see in the second picture so this is these are the bony swellings and this is what a picture of a inflammatory arthritis would look like and the bony swelling would more favor a degenerative arthritis so if you recall your pathology in medical school inflammation consists of five cardinal features 
One is the warmth, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of function. So in arthritis, what happens is there would be inflammation in synovium, which leads to formation of inflammatory fluid. And so when, when inflammatory fluid is built up, in particularly at when you are resting with the uh, lack of blood supply, it will build up within the joint space. So that's why you would get pain with rest. And it relieves by activities because the blood supply to the synovium and so surrounding tissues will gain or increases while you uh, start on activities and this inflammatory fluid will be reabsorbed into the circulation. That's where you would, uh, your symptoms would be relieved with activities. At the same time, what I described by boggy swelling is where there would be an inflammation in the synovium causing synovitis, later on repeated syn uh, synovitis would lead to a hypertrophy of the synovium, lead to a boggy swelling. Whereas in degenerative arthritis, you wouldn't see this swelling and it would be the brony projections or the spurs which would go give rise to a bony swelling. In addition, uh, when we talk about inflammatory arthritis, we describe something called early morning stiffness. As I described earlier, that's because when you sleep, the inflammatory fluid builds up and when you start on activities in the morning, that again gets reabsorbed into circulation, therefore the symptoms get relieved. Now is it rational to ask about uh, early morning stiffness in each and every patient? That is something that you should bear in mind. L let's say a security officer comes. Uh, with joint pains and he described the pains uh, in the evening hours at around two o'clock. So if you look at his detailed history, he's, he's a work, he, he may be working at night, so he won't get the pain and the stiffness in the morning and while he sleeps in the morning and get up at two o'clock, he might feel stiff. So this is what you call the inactivity stiffness. So ideally it's not the early morning stiffness, a stiffness which develops following a period of inactivity which relieves with rest. So the second thing is what is an autoimmune? Autoimmunity is immune system a process where immune system reacts against the body's own normal components producing a disease or functional status. Then in certain instances although we expect the inflammatory markers to be raised not in all cases the inflammatory markers are raised. There can be normal inflammatory markers, in particularly in the cases of psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthritis. And polyarthritis is where you have more than five or more joints involved. Oligoarticular is two to five joints. It's monoarticular is involvement of a single joint. So these are the examples of inflammatory arthritis. Rheumatoid, psoriatic arthritis, spondyloarthritis, where there would be a axial spondyloarthritis, where there is the axial skeletal involvement, and peripheral spondyloarthritis is where there would be other peripheral joint involvement and connective tissue disease related arthritis. Not to forget crystal arthritis, gout, or pseudo gout. This also accounts for inflammatory arthritis. So, the second I would describe the evaluation of a patient with inflammatory arthritis. So it's important to get the gender uh, because in certain autoimmune diseases, in most of the autoimmune diseases are common in females. So diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis and SLE would be common in patients with uh, females, whereas spondyloarthritis would be common in males. The duration is important where there would be to establish the persistence nature of inflammatory arthritis and also previous episodes. In, in cases of gout, you would, uh, if you go through the history, there would be episodic swelling of metatarsophalangeal joints in the foot, first one. 
then establish in the symmetrical and asymmetrical nature of joint involvement and also looking at the joints uh, whether it's the large joints or involved small joints involved or, or distal interphalangeal joints are involved or not so this picture uh, or the diagram would depict uh, joint involvement in osteoarthritis if you uh, go through that these are in osteoarthritis the nodal hand osteoarthritis it would be predominantly distal interphalangeal as well as proximal interphalangeal joint involvement they might also have carpal metacarpal first cmc joint involvement and the mtp joint involvement and the ip joint involvement with tarsal bone involvement so the key feature is that the stiffness with uh, it the symptoms as opposed to inflammatory arthritis would be worse with activities whereas in inflammatory arthritis the symptoms would be relieved with activities the second picture is of a, a patient with psoriatic arthritis where there would be distal interphalangeal as well as proximal interphalangeal joint involvement and also not to forget the axial skeletal involvement with uh, there may be sacroiliac joint involvement at the same time enthesial point involvement and if you if a patient comes with asymmetrical arthritis you need to think about a possibility of psoriatic arthritis or a peripheral manifestation of a spondyloarthritis in rheumatoid arthritis symptoms are more or less symmetrical that and involves small joints of the hands in particular which includes metacarpophalangeal joints proximal interphalangeal joints and also the wrist is taken as a small joint so moving back to the history and at the same time the, in the history it's important to see uh, look for recent histories of infections particularly urinary tract infections in inf inflammatory back pain in cases of uh, spondyloarthritis enthesial pains epicondyle uh, Achilles pain and heel pains, and also a history of uh, skin psoriasis, uveitis, and inflammatory bowel disease. There are maybe features of a connective tissue disease such as male rash, oral ulcers, etc. But don't forget on sicca symptoms that is dry eyes and dry mouth and Raynaud's. Constitutional symptoms, in particularly if uh, there is a loss of weight and loss of appetite, a proper systemic review is needed. to exclude the possibility of a underlying malignancy which can be manifested as a possible inflammatory arthritis also polymyalgic symptoms that is shoulder gird uh, stiffness etc in cases of polymyalgia associated peripheral arthritis as i mentioned previous cancer treatment and comorbidities are too important let me recall one patient whom i saw during the covid period came with the inflammatory joint symptoms and with the mask we generally during the covid period didn't examine the face at all but since there was a redness in skin i asked her to remove the mask and then only uh, we saw i saw uh, the leptomatous patches in her face so that was possibly related to a lepra reaction uh, with le leptomatous uh, leprosy so remember that all inflammatory arthritis are not rheumatoid arthritis there are other uh, causes for inflammatory arthritis but the commonest would be rheumatoid arthritis then in examination joint symptoms predominate in early rheumatoid arthritis therefore rheumatoid nodules or extra articular manifestations are seldomly present at early phase of rheumatoid arthritis but in contrast in other polyarthritis Uh, forms of polyarthritis extra articular manifestations may present early and may precede, precede the onset of synovitis for example in sle you would come across a male rash in psoriatic arthritis skin psoriasis and nail changes may precede the onset of joint symptoms urethritis and conjunctivitis in reed disease and uveitis in spondyloarthritis and there can be lung involvement fever erythema nodosum in sarcoidosis 
So, in ex during the examination, it is important to note the subtle swellings, spindle shapes and the um, metatarch of phalangeal swelling. If asymmetrical, always compare with the contralateral side to make sure that the contralateral side is normal. Then ask the patient to make a good fist and also look for the grip strength. And one important uh, test is the squeeze test. So, which is more suggestive of a possibility of a rheumatoid arthritis? What you need to do is just squeeze your uh, the metatarsophalangeals or metacarphalangeals in between your thumb and the middle finger and see if the, pa uh, the patient gets a pain or not. It is always important to examine the palmar surfaces for fle uh, flexus tenosynovitis. Do not forget the foot, there may be dactylitis etc which patient might not come across or reveal unless you actively look for. The common enthesial sites that you need to look are medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, achilles tendons and the plantar fascia. Remember skin psoriasis may not be evident at first instance, you need to actively look for skin psoriasis particularly around the umbilicus or back of the yellow. Other features of connective tissue diseases like lupus rash, subtle skin thickening or fingertip lesions to exclude the possibility of scleroderma, oral ulcers to look uh, actively to look in the palate, palate as well as the, in the tongue and the moist tongue to exclude the possibility of a Sjogren syndrome. So investigations wise, ESR, CRP as I mentioned may not be always raised, they can be normal in cases of psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthritis. Thrombocytosis can be uh, seen as a marker of inflammation that this should be particularly be noticed in juvenile idiopathic arthritis cases. Depending on the clinical context, let us say a patient presents with first metatarsal phalangeal joint pains, you might order a uric acid etc. Serum calcium ACE inhibitors uh, uh, levels may be necessary in a patient with inflammatory arthritis with erythema nodosa. So, in the clinical context, you need to order investigations. Rheumatoid factor, which we mostly do, may be falsely positive, can be seen in other connective tissue disease and more importantly, this can be seen in normal subjects as well. Anti-CCP is more specific. If you request ANA, please request with the pattern and with the teeter and HLA B27 can be ordered depending on the symptoms. That is, if the patient complains of inflammatory back pain and etc., then only request HLA B27. The cost of HLA B27 is too much high, therefore, do not request them unnecessarily. Radiology, X ray hands and wrist may not reveal much except for a, in the early stages, except for periarticular osteopenia and subtle soft tissue swellings. X-ray feet may be difficult to interpret because of the gravity effect, there can be degenerative changes as well. Ultrasound is quite useful, but this is not, you need to carefully select the cases and order if subclinical or synovitis is not evident to detect the subclinical synovitis. If the synovitis is obviously evident uh, clinically, there is no point in requesting ultrasound scan to look for synovitis because it would not differentiate between the clinical type of arthritis except for cases of crystal arthritis there where you would see a particular sign. MRI in selected cases particularly in uh, arthritis of foot and uh, cancer screening may be uh, needed if you suspect a possibility of a malignancy. So this was a patient who, uh, who presented to me yesterday and this patient was referred uh, suspecting the possibility of a inflammatory arthritis and she is a 50 year so all female diabetic patient who came with pain over right hand, third and fourth fingers. She had an incomplete fist formation and a poor grip strength 
with the tendinous over the third and fourth fingers suggestive of flex flexor tenosynovitis. So with diabetes, this is common and it's a possible uh, mimic of inflammatory arthritis that you need to actively exclude. But remember, even in inflammatory arthritis, multiple flexor tenosynovitis can be seen because RA is a rheumatoid arthritis, it's a disease of synovium. Not only the joints have a synovium, even the tendons have a synovium lining, which can be involved in rheumatoid arthritis. And this is, this can be a tenosynovitis may precede the, precede the development of joint synovitis. Another mimic of inflammatory arthritis is fibromyalgia. This is the 1990 criteria for fibromyalgia. I still put it, this on because this is easy for a primary care physician to identify. Because what you need to do is when a patient comes with widespread pain syndrome for more than three months with unrefreshing sleep, if, if, if the patient has more than 11 out of 18 tender points, think about fibromyalgia. The current criteria is more cumbersome to do in the primary care, care setup. And if you suspect a patient with fibromyalgia, you may refer to the rheumatology uh, clinics to uh, do a proper evaluation. Bec because in cases of fibromyalgia, you need to exclude the possibilities of hypothyroidism, vitamin D deficiencies, or possibility of a hematological malignancy, polymyalgia rheumati uh, rheumatica, PMR, before embarking on the diagnosis of uh, fibromyalgia. So next, I'll move on to uh, uh, move on to describe clinical phases of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, this is a typical hand which I would have seen during my medical school, where there is uh, rheumatoid deformities with the boutonniere deformity, is a thumb, ulnar deviation and dorsal subluxations. But unfortunately, or sorry, fortunately, this is not being seen quite often nowadays. In general practice, you wouldn't be seeing this. And what is, uh, uh, this can be even, even a non-medical person can diagnose this kind of a uh, uh, joint or uh, thing uh, and for to make a diagnosis of rheumatoid. What you get in primary care setup is mainly uh, early arthritis where it's very difficult to describe whether it's a rheumatoid arthritis or in inflammatory arthritis or a normal uh, phenomenon. We, however, we don't see this picture now. Mostly what we come across are joint symptoms at this point. Why is it? So it's important to nip it in the bud. The reason is prompt diagnosis at early stages would prevent somebody or a patient getting the deformities. So which these two things have un, uh, helped us to prevent the deformities occurring. So firstly, prompt diagnosis at early stages. One thing is we understand the clinical progression of rheumatoid arthritis more now. There are revisions of criteria and also assistance from the radiology and autoantibodies. Then the second thing is why we don't see deformities is we commence on DMARCH or disease modifying treatments early and there are updated management guidelines. So clinical phases of RA, there is healthy individuals who develop arthralgia, later on develop undifferentiated arthritis which move on moves on to all, develop established RA. Where a primary care physician would see is mostly this phase where there would be arthralgia and early undifferentiated uh, inflammatory arthritis. Now, if a patient comes to you with arthralgia, what you need to know uh, or find out is whether this is clinically significant. Let me talk about a patient uh, with the inflammatory arthralgia to understand this concept. 
a 45 year old female presenting with a 6 months history of inflammatory arthralgia affecting small joints of hands is coming to rheumatology clinic and her symptoms worse in the early mornings and would last for more than one hour. She gives a family history of rheumatoid arthritis in her first degree relatives but examination did not reveal any features of a CTD or synovitis but she had a positive MCP squeeze test. Now what do you mean by arthralgia is it is only the pain and there would not be any swelling of joints. So most of the people or the patients comes with this kind of a phenomenon and it is important for you to identify whether it is a clinically significant or not. So Eula define characteristics of uh, uh, inflammatory arthralgia which are at risk of uh, progressing to rheumatoid arthritis. So there are seven uh, characteristics they de describe. If the joint symptoms of are of recent onset, symptoms are located mainly in the MCP joints, duration of morning stiffness lasting for more than 60 minutes, more severe symptoms presenting in early morning and there is a family stuff rheumatoid arthritis with the examination findings of poor fist and a positive MCP squeeze test, these patient needs are, are needs a, a, a rheumatology assessment. So you, you all need to pick this group of people and refer to the rheumatology clinic whereas you might safely discharge or, uh, the rest of the patient with arthralgia. But if a patient comes coming with the arthralgia has these symptoms, please make sure that they have been followed up at for development of rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory arthritis in a rheumatology clinic. So one more thing which I talked about late earlier, inflammatory arthritis is suggested, suggested by positive MCP, MTP squeeze test. This has been used to identify patients at risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. This is a leaflet in NHS and uh, where the uh, a patient uh, education leaflet and it, it's in one important feature they would mention it. They advise the patient to look for the squeezing. If the squeeze test is positive, this might be inflammatory arthritis, and they advise the patients to uh, go for uh, or medical to seek medical advice. The secondly, uh, one thing. Uh, this is the criteria that we all learned when we were in medical school. Uh, so this, if you go through this 1987 classification criteria of rheumatoid arthritis, you would come across, uh, now if you say rheumatoid nodules, uh, marks one mark and also the radiographic mark erosions and unequal equivocal body calcifications, decalcification localized in or adjacent to the involved joints so posterior lateral hand and wrist radiographs. These are features of advanced rheumatoid arthritis. If we wait until these to be developed, you will be ending up with the first picture that I have shown. But these criteria have uh, revised. Now 2010 criteria is uh, a much more different thing and it uh, sort of identified people, uh, patients with early uh, arthritis. But still this has a problem because the, all these are classification criteria. The, uh, all the, all the uh, most of the diseases in rheumatology uh, are does not have diagnostic criteria. So they are, uh, the diagnosis is based on the clinical features not on the diagnostic criteria. Remember that. So this is like something like that. Diagnostic criteria is a set of signs and symptoms and tests developed for use in routine clinical practice to guideline, guide the care of individual patients. Whereas classification criteria are primarily intended to create a well-defined, relatively homogeneous cohort for clinical results. So this, what happens is, we apply classification criteria to make a diagnosis, which is uh, which is wrong in the sense that uh, we'll be missing a whole lot of patients with inflammatory arthritis if we go on to uh, diagnose patient based on the classification criteria. 
So this is, I, I'll simplify this. If you have a jar of candies, uh, this is like the normal population. If you select the Smarties out of the candies, so there would be red Smarties, yellow Smarties, and blue Smarties, etc. So applying the, these classification criteria is something like that. So it would give a relatively a homogeneous cohort and you will be missing out on the red, red Smarties, etc. So remember, diagnosis of inflammatory arthritis is clinical and it's not based on a criteria. These are the typical advanced X-ray changes in rheumatoid arthritis. There would be carpal crowding and destruction of uh, ulnar styloid with uh, carpal bone fusion. And the typical uh, erosions are periarticular. And ultrasounds are useful to detect erosions because uh, they are most uh, sensitive to detection of uh, erosions as opposed to X-rays. So since the rheumatoid arthritis is the most common form of inflammatory arthritis, I would briefly discuss about the management principles and I would not go into de uh, detailed guidelines, I would just give the management principles. So what happens in rheumatoid arthritis is management wise, it's mainly multidisciplinary. If you take a, a, pay a sort of, this is like a, a seesaw where one side of the seesaw is loaded and with increased joint symptoms, with high disease activity, restricted ADL and with the presence of extraarticular manifestations. What you have to do is, push this up by pushing the other end down. How do we do this? We are doing this through controlling of symptoms and disease activity with NSAIDs, steroids and DMARDs and applying lifestyle modification, stopping smoking, weight management. In cases of restricted ADL, doing OT and a PT assessment and controlling of extraarticular manifestations. The important extraarticular ones are ILD, cardiovascular risk, and osteoporosis. So I'll mainly talk about the pharmacological management in next few slides. So there are updated guidelines, 2016 EULA recommendations, as well as 2019 updated management guidelines. So what is the most important thing is to treat the disease early. So diagnose the patient, don't wait till you fulfill the classification criteria based on the inflammatory nature of the symptoms, start on disease modifying treatment as soon as possible. Why? Any delay in the start of, uh, start, commencement of DMARDs can lead to worse outcomes in comparison with early patients who have been st started on DMARDs earlier. So what is the best uh, treatment? The patient should be ideally commenced on DMARDs within the first three months. Why? The reason is there's something called the window of, window of opportunity, where if you start on the, the disease modifying drugs within the first three months, there's a chances of halting the disease progression and minimizing the joint damage and preventing erosions from happening. So this is what you call the window of opportunity. But remember, if you start on DMARDs, it would not act on the same day itself. It would take at least four to six weeks in cases of um, uh, leflunamide and may take more than that in case of, uh, in, uh, if you commence on other DMARDs such as sulfasalicine, etc. The second thing is, you'd be treating rheumatoid uh, arthritis looking at a target. So that's 20 is a commonly used uh, 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 scoring system that is being uh, used to objectively analyze the clinical symptom improvement where you would be uh, uh, taking a composite score uh, comprising of tender joint count, swollen joint count, inflammatory markers, and also patient's global assessment scoring. So if there would be objective assessment, 
the baseline scoring and also in case of a newly diagnosed patient you would be aiming for a score of less than 2.6 now what is the place of steroids in controlling rheumatoid arthritis now one the concept is this is like a bridging where you you have a, let's say you have a river to cross you have to get to the other side of the river so if if there is no if there is no permanent uh, bridge in place you would be putting a temporary bridge steroids does something like that so you until the permanent structure is built up you will be using the steroids to cross the bridge and once the permanent structure is uh, uh, built up you can remove the safely remove the bridge that was uh, built to cross the road so this the steroids help to do something like that so until the, the disease modifying treatment acts for symptomatic control and the re reduction of inflammation we will be using the steroids so ideally you should use the lowest possible dose and you can use it up to 6 months as an adjunct treatment not only the oral or systemic steroids you can use intra articular group corticoids to relieve the symptoms and inflammation so this is the action of steroids uh, in a simplified manner so you start on a steroid dose and gradually taper it over the next 2 to 3 months and the action of dmarch would take up the role of the steroids so that's the basis of steroids in inflammatory arthritis so some few questions of uh, about uh, steroids is prednisolone far superior than methylprednisolone or the vice versa there is no data on that both prednisolone and methylprednisolone in clinical practice has the same efficacy what dose what we will be using is a moderate dose 15 mg of steroids are in, uh, enough to control inflammatory joint symptoms for how long that that is for the minimal duration ideally less than 6 months are divided doses are effective that is giving an octa dose so this is uh, this can be explained like this now steroids we know all know that there is a circadian rhythm where the secretion is more in the morning but in rheumatoid arthritis you can use the no, uh, dose at night let's say if you are giving a 15 mg of steroids we can use 10 in the morning 5 at in the night why as i mentioned in my first slide symptoms would be more with the inactivity if so if you give a night dose this would relieve the symptoms which come with the inactivity at night or the patient would not feel much of a early morning stiffness if you give a, a divided doses of steroids are intramuscular injections effective yes they do uh, 120 mg of dipomethrin are quite effective given as a injection in the thigh when i first return uh, from uh, uk i used to give a lot of intramuscular injections of dipomethrin but later on found that uh, when i started working at new orleans that the patient didn't come for three or four months because they thought that it was a permanent cure they stop all their disease modifying treatment it is important to uh, uh, and uh, educate the patient that this is a temporary relief and it would uh, work uh, this dipomethrin would uh, slowly get into the circulation relieving the symptoms until the uh, methotrexate or other dmarch sets in its action there are numerous steroids like deflecoate we still don't know the clinical benefits there are a few trials coming from india where it it which has shown lesser side effects but this has not been uh, sort of established in the guidelines so far so what is the place of uh, nsh it's it's just a symptomatic relief in um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, or inflammatory arthritis but there is a place in the pathophysiology in cases of spondyloarthritis which i am not going to describe but in select 
uh, when you want to stay, select NSAIDs, it would depend on the gastrointestinal side effects, renal and cardiovascular risk. So, naproxen is the safest in NSAIDs from cardiovascular point of view, but unfortunately, it has more GI side effects. Acyclofenac and itrococcyl have less GI side effects, but in government sector, we only have diitrofenac, celecoxib, and sometimes we get an naproxen uh, stocks uh, not on a regular basis. So, on long term, avoid regular NSAIDs, change over to as required or SOS basis. But in the presence of coexisting osteoarthritis, you might not be able to take off NSAIDs completely and you might need to give a time to time regular dose or uh, as required on an as required basis. Apart from GI, renal and cardiovascular risk factors, I also look at this when I prescribe NSAIDs. One thing is the Tmax, that is the time taken to uh, to exert its maximum effect and also the half-life. Now, if you take naproxen, it would give sort of uh, start acting within two to four hours and the half-life would be 12 to 15 hours. When it comes to diclofenac, it would act quickly, but it would not last for more than two, month, two hours. So it's a short acting one. Unless you give a extended release preparations, uh, the patient would uh, need to take it on a regular basis. And also, uh, if we take celecoxib, it will take a little bit of time to act, but half-life would be 11, 11 hours. For etrococcib, Tmax would be one hour to one and a half hours, but would have a long half-life of 22 hours. Meloxicam would take a longer duration to act, but the half-life would be 20 hours. So select your NSAID based on the cardiovascular, renal and GI side effects as well as looking at these profiles. So the next moving on to rheumatologist armory, we have a, quite a number of drugs in our armory. Starting from hydroxychloroquine to biologics, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, leflunamide, all are available in Sri Lanka. And also, we can use azathioprine in cases of, uh, con if there's, there are contraindications to the above mentioned CSD marks or during the pregnancy. These are Janus kinase inhibitors. Tofacin is available here in Sri Lanka. Biological DMARDs, we have TNF-alpha inhibitors with adalimumab, golibumab and infliximab and the CD20 inhibitors of rituximab and IL-6 inhibitor tocilizumab. But the problem with these are, it's so expensive that it would cost about uh, one or two millions per year if you start on biologic DMARDs. So it's important that we Diagnose the patients with inflammatory arthritis early and prevent joint damage and nip it in the bud before uh, the disease progress where we can use uh, conventional synthetic DMARDs and control the disease. So it's important to use the weapons in the right context. Well, let's say you have a soldier who's walking on the street and unless the patient or the soldier is in a battlefield, you wouldn't go and shoot him. So it's like that. So if you have a joint symptom, unless it is inflammatory, you would not start on DMARDs. So make sure that not to start on the disease modifying drugs for non-inflammatory arthritis. That is, it's irrational to use sulfasalazine or leflunamide, etc in cases of pure osteoarthritis. Even if you see a patient with rheumatoid factor positivity, let's say 1 over 32, 1 over 64, with osteoarthritis of knee joints with no inflammatory symptoms, you are not, you, you should not use DMARDs. What you need to do is go ahead with quadriceps strengthening, NSAIDs, st local steroid injections, and referral to orthopedics if required. And in the, in the context of milder form of diseases, you should not uh, use the 
extreme spectrum of D mass. That is, you may use just a hydroxychloroquine and sulfur salicine with or without methotrexate. In cases of the high, high activity, it would be inappropriate to use hydroxychloroquine or methotrexate. You might need the escalations with uh, triple D mass therapy or biologic treatment. So what are the uh, side effects profile of uh, CSD marks? Because these people may come to OPD, etc. with the side effects. For example, the commonest side of, uh, effect of uh, methotrexate is nausea and vomiting and they might also have uh, alopecia. Nausea for if patient develop uh, nausea and vomiting, we try giving uh, methotrexate as divided doses and also increasing the fo folic acid frequency. Then there can be cytopenias. If a patient with methotrexate comes with fever, it's always important to do at least a full blood count to see the WBC count. And there may be transaminitis. And what is seen with methotrexate is when you commence on methotrexate, you will be coming across pneumonitis rather than interstitial lung disease. So it's important to detect, uh, be aware of leflunamide. It can uh, cause hypertension. So let, let's say a patient well control, uh, with well-controlled hypertension who was recently commenced on leflunamide coming with uh, resistant or coming with a resistant form that may be purely because of the uh, commencement of leflunamide. Leflunamide can also close, uh, cause cytopenias and transaminitis. And with sulfur salicine, there can be uh, Steven Johnson syndrome hydroxychloroquine can cause a uh, retinopathy. In cases of biologic DMARCH, rituximab increases the hepatitis B, C reactivation risk and also increases the general infection risk. TNF in inhibitors, that is infliximab, etc., increases the TB react reactivation risk. So a patient who receives received uh, infliximab in the past may come up with weight loss, loss of appetite and a chronic cough. In that case, you might need to think about the possibility of uh, tuberculosis and exclude uh, tu uh, acute uh, tuberculosis. And tocilizumab can cause lipid metabolism uh, um, and uh, derangement in lipid metabolism and neutropenias. So this I mentioned earlier. These are what uh, we have in Sri Lanka, the biology forms of biology. But it's important to remember these medicines do cost uh, millions to the government. So what we need to do is diagnose inflammatory arthritis early, try to nip it in the bud and prevent them uh, going into a state where they would need uh, biologic demands. This is uh, one slide on up updated guidelines on uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which I would not go into detail. The basis would be uh, you would try with uh, initially with glucocorticoids and uh, methotrexate, unless contraindicated. If uh, somebody has fertility wishes, you might uh, try sulfur salicine. You try for some duration. If not responding, you may. Uh, decide on biologic demands depending on the prognostic factors, presence of prognostic factors. Be aware of how the extraarticular manifestations of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, particularly pulmonary disease. There can be interstitial lung disease associated with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. The cardiovascular risk is in increased and also neurological symptoms. Uh, the patients might come with uh, increased uh, lower limb reflexes where the problem would be atlantoaxial subluxations. And also keep in mind that the malignancy risk is increased, particularly the hematological malignancies, risk of uh, hematological malignancies. So a few points about MTX. We all know that infections are certainly seen in associated with MTX use. The true risk is associated with the disease is not um, very clear because severe forms of RA itself uh, uh, is a risk factor for 
infections please bear that in mind then methotrexate and ild this was a traditionally belief that uh, belief that uh, mtx causes interstitial lung disease but it's not so because uh, actually now the evidence suggests that mtx may delay the onset of ild and it's what you see in uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis as interstitial lung disease is mainly a, a part of the disease process uh, that the best evidence is in psoriatic arthritis we all use methotrexate but they we don't see much of interstitial lung disease in them so that implies that it's more of the disease related the interstitial that uh, lung disease that we come across rather than mtx induced ild what we actually see with methotrexate is a pneumonitis pneumonitis remains a concern with mtx therapy particularly in the first year so patients receiving mtx might come with us dyspnea cough you might need to think about a pneumonitis so this risk is particularly increase in elderly patients with diabetes and also it's a bear in mind that mtx can cause a pancytopenia even if the patient is stable for years on mtx you, they might develop pancytopenia at certain points so finally i would discuss this patient who came to me a diagnosed patient with rheumatoid arthritis for one year was referred through opd and he was previously managed in a local hospital but defaulted follow up follow up after one month treatment later sought cure from ayurveda ayurveda nevertheless had under satisfactory response so he came back to uh, the hospital seeking uh, help from western medicine there was active synovitis of bilateral mcp joints pip joints and both knee joints inflammatory markers were raised full blood count and alt was normal i was about to commence mtx what the patient said was no weekly tablet do not work for me i tried them for one month in the past there was no response at all i could not tolerate six tablets it is a cancer medications injections are not good so the first point is very crucial here it's important for us to convey to the patient that the dmarts take time to act it's a role that the pri- primary care physician can play even if uh, we tell it several times the patient would not understand this so that's why we give in nesses an adequate amount of steroids at the beginning of the disease for to relieve the pain until the action of dmarts sets in so commencing dmarts the golden rule would be go slow make the patient to believe that the medications are working sometimes i don't really start on dmarts during the first visit i ask the patient to give a good dose of steroid ask him to come within 2 weeks and then only start on methotrexate uh, because then the patient uh, feels about the western medicine and he uh, develops a sort of a belief in western medicine so the adequate initial dose of steroids and then slowly tail off gradually introduce dmarts start with a low dose and gradually escalate explain common side effects that is the gi intolerance with mtx you may need to increase the folic acid frequency and might need to give frequent appointments in the rheumatology clinics try your best to continue with mtx or uh, go for maximum tolerable mtx dose so if the patient is not tolerating 15 mg if he is tolerating 5 tablets you must try to maintain you know 5 and then add the other drugs rather than completely take it off and add a new drug so it's important to clarify what is intolerance to mtx don't make too many changes at a time because if one thing goes wrong you will if one thing goes wrong you will be back to square one if something is not broken do not fix it that is if you find a rheumatoid factor positivity without inflammatory symptoms don't go and start on dmars unless the patient has inflammatory symptoms this approach will save unnecessary escalations to biologic dmars so i'll finally talk about this 
it's a night for nightmare for us when a patient comes with inflammatory sounding joint symptoms but without any elicitable clinical signs so the question that we have is whether we are dealing with an early arthritis has somebody treated the patient with steroids in primary care masking the true clinical picture so it's common to give dexamethasone in pri uh, the primary care so what i would advise is if you come across a patient with inflammatory arth sounding joint symptom please do refer earlier to the closest rheumatology clinic or if the rheumatologist is not available to a specialist clinic or a medical clinic ideally without treating with steroids or nsaids if you start on nsaids or steroids please do disclose because otherwise we will have to do a Sherlock Holmes in the clinic treatment with the demats can be commenced based on inflammatory nature of the symptoms without waiting till classification criteria are fulfilled so the classification criteria are not necessary to make it or to commence the treatment for uh, inflammatory arthritis early demats initiation will prevent long term joint damage or deformities so I would just say this, uh, I was over the moon when I look at this referral from Marthale OPD and this uh, particular medical officer at the OPD has done, rightly done, what we, we all want. So he has picked inflammatory arthritis on 2020, 3rd of ninth, uh, uh, sorry, uh, March, 9th of March and he had highlighted on the uh, need of an early date in the rheumatology clinic uh, because the nursing officers would not know what to do with each and every day. So the, what the nurses of, nursing officer has done is given an early extra date on the next day as an extra clinic booking. So this is what we require from a primary care physician, identify the joint disease even if there is no rheumatoid factor. If you think that is a rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory arthritis, refer the patient because nobody would scold you it's important that you refer the patient you pick up the inflammatory symptoms and if if the patient has clinically detectable sorry clinic inflammatory arthralgia make sure that the patient has clinically significant arthralgia and make a early referral so during this uh, presentation I hope that I gave an overview of diagnosing, treating and re uh, referring appropriately and also gave a uh, broad overview about the extra-articular manifestation and comorbidities and the treatment related complications. So if you are interested, you can uh, go through these for further reading and I would like to uh, thank GMO a academic subcommittee for inviting me to present on uh, inflammatory arthritis uh, for primary care physicians and it was uh, really uh, exciting or uh, really a useful effort. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much Dr. Amal Thilakaratna for joining us today and it was a very interesting and very informative lecture and thank you all for joining us and I hope to see you in two weeks time.